Welcome and hello, I'm Linda Yu, Chair of the Royal Commonwealth Society and it is my privilege to moderate this webinar, The Road to Chogum, during Commonwealth Week. The Royal Commonwealth Society is the oldest civil society organization dedicated to the Commonwealth and a long-standing convener of key events in the Commonwealth, such as this one. In June 2021, at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, Chogum, in Kigali, the UK will hand over to Rwanda as Chair and Office of the Commonwealth. Commonwealth leaders, along with a wide swathe of the Commonwealth family, including the charitable and business sectors, will convene under the overarching theme, Delivering a Common Future, Connecting, Innovating, Transforming, Building on the London Chogum 2018 outcomes, which were inspired by the theme, towards a common future, delivering achievable, comprehensive, meaningful, and powerful initiatives that affect change will be at the forefront of discussions. Today, we will cover topics such as what are the UK's priorities on the road to Chogum, with Rwanda becoming chair in office, what's on the agenda for the Commonwealth, and how will the Commonwealth collectively seek to tackle present global issues. To address these topics, we're privileged to be joined by the Honorable Dr. Vincent Baruta, Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Government of Rwanda, and by Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon, Minister of State for South Asia and the Commonwealth at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office of the UK Government. A very warm welcome to you both. I'm going to start with Lord Ahmed to outline the UK's priorities before bringing in Dr. Baruta to speak on Rwanda's plans as the next chair in office. So Lord Ahmed, the UK has had an extended year as chair in office of the Commonwealth due to Chogun being delayed um, on a cause of the pandemic. We were pleased to hear about your plans when we hosted you last year. How has progress been? And can you please share with us your priorities in the coming months before Chogun? Well, Dr. Yu, it's great to join you all and everyone across the Common Royal Commonwealth Society. And I may tribute to the organization for all the work you do in strengthening the voice of the Commonwealth and the work of the Commonwealth and this quite unique network of 54 nations. You're quite right to raise the point that we have an extended year in office. I may reflect back to 2018. I, I didn't think, um, certainly, and one should never as a politician predict their own future or indeed that in terms of our tenure as chair in office. But the pandemic that has engulfed us all has changed the way we work. Uh, just before we came on air, we were talking about the new challenges in terms of uh, the virtual world we now live in. But I think it shows that how technology has been a real enabler. And I think that can only be looked at positively as we look at connectivity across the Commonwealth 54. Um, some of your uh, people on the call, some of the people on the call and working within our Commonwealth family will know that in September last year, notwithstanding the pandemic, the United Kingdom published a comprehensive chair in office report uh, looking at collective achievements since Chogham 2018, uh, how we work with the Commonwealth network of partners, the incredible civil society organizations that are a crucial part of the Commonwealth. And it was all linked back to the sort of key pillars that I'm sure we recall uh, very fondly from 2018 on issues of sustainability, security, fairness and prosperity. And it's great to be doing this uh, webinar together with my good friend, Dr. Vincent Marita from Rwanda. He and I have been on regular exchanges, uh, virtual and otherwise on the phone as Rwanda look forward towards hosting the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. And we will continue to work very closely with Rwanda on the handover of the formal responsibilities as chair in office. Um, all I'll say to Dr. Barunta, we've had to keep the seat warm for an added year, but it's been a huge privilege. But it also, we're looking forward to handing over the baton to your good selves. But if I may just quickly run through some of the key elements within those key four pillars. First of all, on sustainability. Um, We've supported as the UK through the Commonwealth Network, uh, 17 small island developing states, the SIDS as we often refer to them, to develop sustainable and climate resilient marine economies. Um, under the Blue Charter of the Commonwealth, we were delighted to work very closely with uh, Vanuatu on the Clean Oceans Alliance. And I think that's another uniqueness about the Commonwealth. Now a country like the United Kingdom, um, where we are in the world, 
and also working alongside small island developing states such as Vanuatu, because it is challenges and how we meet them together, which really is the strength of the Commonwealth. And that's been focused on simple things of cleaning up our plastic pollution. But as we, with one eye on the COP later this year in Glasgow, I think the continuation of what we're doing around the Blue Charter and indeed the voice of the Commonwealth, certainly it is our hope, our aspiration, working very closely with Rwanda to ensure the voice of the Commonwealth is very clearly heard on the sustainability agenda later this year in Glasgow. If I may also then turn to security, um, every country has benefited. Again, we were pleased to support and fund cybersecurity capability building. Here we are again talking of the virtual world. But the challenges of cybersecurity cannot be underestimated. And it's important that countries around the Commonwealth who perhaps may not have the technical capacity can actually leverage the expertise from across the Commonwealth family to ensure we meet the challenges. And this has led to 115 capacity building events across 32 countries, which I think is a real testament of how the Commonwealth family works together. Fairness, when I know uh, to you, for you personally, this has been a real priority about how we invest in education. And many will know of our Prime Minister's passion for girls' education in particular, 12 years of quality education for every girl across the world. And therefore, the UK-funded Girls' Education Challenge, uh, for which a commitment was made of £212 million, was announced at Chogham 2018. And just as a report card on that, if I may, we've now supported up to 1.5 million marginalised girls across 17 countries, uh, of which 11 are from within the Commonwealth family. So much more still to be done. It remains at the heart of delivery for the UK government again. We look forward to working with Commonwealth partners because, you know, if I may just reflect as a parent to three children, one who is, a, a, I call her a young girl, she's uh, 15 coming on to 35 with some of the pronouncements we often hear. But nevertheless, when you invest in a girl's education, you don't just invest in her life, you invest in her family's life, in a community's life, in a town's life, in a society's life, in a country's life. And for us, we invest in the future of girls across the Commonwealth. And finally on prosperity, since 2018, again with a focus specifically on women, I'm really proud that the She Trades Commonwealth Programme that was announced by our former Prime Minister, Theresa May, has provided training and mentoring now to over 3,300 women. And training and mentoring, which has helped set up new, uh, over 3,000 women-owned businesses. And this has also included 30 million pounds in sales for women, business owners emerging in four target countries, Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, and Bangladesh. And we've also, as a sort of final point on this, of what's been achieved, you will know, and I've said to others as well, we need to really strengthen the voice of the Commonwealth uh, in international fora, whether it's the UN, and in this regard, in July, the Commonwealth leaders on our initiative issued a joint statement on a full range of international responses. The foreign ministers, including Foreign Minister, Ruta was there that looked at the issues of COVID-19. There was also a collective statement on racism and the challenges we face there. And on the 5th of October, um, I was very proud because we've been working on this for a long time. It was the first ever Commonwealth chair in office delivered our first ever Commonwealth statement at the UN Human Rights Council. And I think that's an important achievement. And in the same month, of course, we had the CFAM meeting as well. And very briefly looking ahead to Rwanda as we congratulate Rwanda on their preparations. We welcome the five broad themes that have been announced, which I'm sure Foreign Minister will speak to. But we want to ensure that the Chogamo 2021 really demonstrates uh, what has been uh, achieved over the last uh, few years during our chair in office. But equally, the continuity from our period as chair in office to Rwanda's but also on the important challenges we face, whether it's COVID-19 or indeed the challenges around climate change, that every international meeting should not be seen as a meeting which is standalone. There needs to be a continuity of the agreements and indeed the practical uh, achievements of each meeting to ensure it translates into the next gathering of leaders. Therefore, we're very much looking forward to Chogham 2021. It's a pleasure to join you again today. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Ahmed. Um, 
really a terrific uh, to hear about your priorities and an update on achieving those and um, hearing about continuity through international meetings. That's hugely important. So um, it was um, great to have you uh, then and great to have you now. So Dr. Baruta, we've heard about the UK's uh, priorities. Um, we'd be keen to hear about Rwanda's plans for Chogun and your aims for this important meeting. Thank you. Um, Chogun 2021 will be an opportunity for Rwanda to reaffirm our commitment to global solidarity and cooperation and to advance matters of common interest in areas such as health, security, uh, gender equality, climate change, and economic recovery after COVID-19. And Chogam will also serve as a platform to build consensus for future engagement. Uh, over the two years of Rwanda's chair in office, we will, be build, we will build on what has been achieved through previous Chogams and with a strong focus on action and impact work with all member countries to implement what will be agreed upon in June. And we also take forward uh, uh, implementation of uh, the previous programs, decision and uh, commitments. So uh, that's really uh, what we aim uh, for the meeting in June. And uh, the main word will be implementation and impact. Thank you. Thank you. I think those are very welcome words, um, impact and implementation. As we all know, you can have great plans, but it's the execution. So that's brilliant to hear. Um, both of you have mentioned it, the pandemic and of course the climate crisis remain front of mind for us all. Um, Lord Ahmed, how is the UK and the Commonwealth collectively working to ensure equitable access to uh, COVID-19 vaccines and to combat climate change. Noting, of course, you've mentioned the UK will be hosting COP26 um, in Glasgow later this year. Of course, no, and thank you. And I think it was a great achievement for the Commonwealth, our, our declaration of unity when it came to the issue of the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, it's no known borders. It doesn't know any kind of distinction between people's wealth and prosperity, developed or developing, race, religion, gender. There is no reason and as we found tragically here in the united kingdom the challenge we faced of covid19 but there is a glimmer of hope i think it's again a reflection of the collaboration across the commonwealth that we've seen real strength and partnerships working indeed for the uk ourselves our strong partnership with india has lent to the support uh, that we're seeing internationally between az and the serum institute and that vaccine is a major part of the uh, global COVAX, global vaccines facility, which we're very pleased to support, which includes 31 Commonwealth countries. And it was really heartening to hear that we've seen the first batch of these vaccines arriving in Ghana, Uganda, and indeed uh, Rwanda recently. And we ourselves are very committed because this is about equitable and fair access for all. And we've, as the UK government, uh, through the Prime Minister directly announced over half a billion pounds today, 548 million pounds, which will allow the supply of 1.3 billion doses in 2021 and vaccination for up to 650 million people. Now, there's a lot more still to do. I think, you know, ensuring we secure supply chains, but I think it's a real credit on how we're working together as the Commonwealth family. And it's great to see many Commonwealth partners now also receiving and starting their own vaccination programs. A brief word on climate change, I've already alluded to that, but it's important that the declarations, the agreements that are reached in Kigali in 2021, that we really look to strengthen the voice of the Commonwealth in further action on this important agenda when it comes to COP26. And we look forward to working with Rwanda and other Commonwealth partners in this respect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lord Ahmed, and that's brilliant to hear. Um, Dr. Baruta, same question to you. How can the Commonwealth collectively address these shared challenges of the environment and the pandemic? I believe you are a physician and I know you're also a previous Minister of Health and a previous Minister of the Environment. So you're particularly well placed to consider these challenges. Thank you. Um, I think the emergency we are in today should not have us lose sight of pre-existing threats. 
The Commonwealth has already demonstrated uh, its capacity to lead in environment and climate change, and we will continue to do so in the fight against COVID-19 and uh, access to vaccines and therapeutics. It is critical that we build resilient health systems and particularly emergency response capabilities to be able to prevent as well as respond to future threats. The same way we use Chogam 2021 to raise ambitions for, COVID, for, for COP26, sorry. We will focus on a few critical initiatives and tangible outcomes that can support our communities affected by the global COVID-19 crisis. Thanks to strategic partnerships that include all stakeholders from the private sector to international organizations and the civil society, we will be able to address current challenges and better prepare for future ones. Thank you. That's great to hear. And I think the very broad um, Commonwealth network and family working together, as you say, at different levels, I think that will be very key um, to thinking about how we can collectively um, try and address these, um, these massive challenges. Um, that actually leads me nicely in the last few minutes we have to, um, I'm going to stay with you, Dr. Bruta, for a moment. Um, a final question um, to both of our distinguished leaders here today. How can each of us, as individual members of the Commonwealth family, um, what would you like for us to do? How can we help um, address these and other shared challenges? I would say that uh, governments surely cannot do it alone. The kind of challenges we are, we are faced with require concerted efforts and close collaboration between all actors and stakeholders. And we need individual actions, which when combined, will contribute to the changing of the world. Therefore, we also need to continue empowering and encouraging our youth who are talented to join the fight. So individual efforts, individual actions put together will contribute to collective achievements. So uh, the effort of, of everyone is needed for us to be able to deliver on the promises. Thank you. Thank you. It's always good to remind ourselves that 60% of the population of the Commonwealth are young people, the 1.6 billion, um, you know, who are passionate about these causes. And um, that's a wonderful, um, reminder of how important it is um, that we individually um, need to take up um, these challenges. So same question to you, uh, Lord Ahmed, about what can we all do individually to help? Sure, just, just on that point, if I may, on the 60%, I was once reminded by a very appropriate organization within the Commonwealth family. Let's have a big shout out for the 40% who are not, of which I am one of the members. So let's not forget the elders. It's from the elders we seek wisdom and guidance, and we should never forget that there are the foundations on which we build. But I agree with uh, Dr. Burita, it's the youth that we provide the opportunities for, and it's important, and we look forward to the youth element within uh, Chogham. But as you asked that question, I think we look and we meet on the in, in Commonwealth Week, I, I remember just down the you know way from here at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office outside our Parliament. It's a real proud moment when you see the flag of the Commonwealth flying and fluttering. And that day the sun shined on Monday. This is London, but the sun shined on Monday for Commonwealth Day. And we saw the beauty of the Commonwealth family, a unique family across the globe, which came together. And when we look at the Commonwealth, and we look at the Commonwealth Day affirmation, what really stands out is, and I quote here, uh, stewards of the earth joining together in kinship, affinity and diversity and unity. And in diversity and unity, we find our strength. The diversity and unity is often challenged. And on a serious note, we need to be unified in our response to those who use the narrative that diversity is a weakness. Far from it, it's a quite unique strength of each nation. It is a unique strength and a dynamism of our Commonwealth 54 family. And a final reflection, if I may, I think we've talked in very sobering terms and rightly so. It's a somber moment when we reflect all those people around the world, the millions who've been impacted, and sadly also the many millions of families who have been impacted directly by the tragedy of COVID-19 and the pandemic that continues to challenge us. 
But if there's one lesson, and I was asked this, that we've learned from the pandemic, what it is, what is it? What we've learned is the interdependency of humanity. We look in our own homes. You know, for me personally, whether it was my wife and I, whether it was my six-year-old, my 15-year-old, and vice versa, we learned not only to play off each other, we learned from the strengths and challenges of each other to come together much more stronger as a family unit. The same applied amongst our neighbors, the same applied amongst our communities, towns. And you know what, Dr. Yu, the same applies when it comes to the Commonwealth family. We are stronger together, and the interdependency of humanity is demonstrated through the unity and diversity of the Commonwealth 54. Thank you. Thank you very much. And indeed, um, at the beginning of this week, Commonwealth Day, um, we very much as a Commonwealth family um, have um, put on events and celebrations to celebrate community, which has come through so strongly this year in the pandemic. So um, that's a brilliant note and um, from both of you to end on. And yes, Lord Ahmed, let's not forget those of us who are non-youth in the Commonwealth. <laughs> um, so thank you very much to Lord Ahmed and Dr. Garuta. It's been a great session, um, very informative. That's helped us see more clearly the road to Chogum and what the Commonwealth can accomplish by working collectively on some of these big shared challenges of our time. So thanks very much for taking the time to speak to us today. And a huge thanks to all of you for joining us for, on today's webinar. Please go to um, www. Um, worldcwsociety.org for more information about the society's work. Um, so thank you all and enjoy a brilliant day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.